This section won't come as much of a, of a surprise to you if you have already looked at the last section of the book or watched the last video. Um, this section is on integration in R3 so, and in RN, but that's in the more depth part of the section. I'm just going to talk about integration in R3. So in three dimensions, uh, triple integrals. In the last section, we integrated in two dimensions. We had double integrals. This will, should just seem like the, the three-dimensional version of that. We won't do many examples here because the next few sections of the book are on applications of double and mainly triple integrals to problems like mass and centers of mass. So um, let's just talk about the problem. Suppose, and this really should seem completely analogous to the two-dimensional case. Suppose you've got some solid object in space. Now, we're not actually going to deal with something as weird as what I'm drawing, but I'm just trying to make a point. So you take some solid region in space, and you'd like to be able to integrate over it. What, what's the idea? Well, suppose you had this solid object that's this strange thing, and it has variable density, and you wanted to know the total mass of the object. It's an easy application to talk about, just as we did in two dimensions. How would you approximate the mass of this weird object if the density varied? So if the density were some function of x, y, and z, well, you should know at this point what you would do. You chop up, you chop up the solid region into lots of rectangular solid, you know, little rectangular solid regions, so call them boxes. You chop up this solid region into lots of little rectangular boxes. And in each box, you pick a sample point, and you evaluate the density at the sample point, and then you multiply times the volume of that little box, and that gives you an estimate of the mass of the little box. Why would you expect that to be good? Well, if your density function is continuous, and your box is small enough, then you then the value of the density function at one point should be approximately the same as the value at all the points because it's a small box. So your approximation for the mass of that little box is just the density function evaluate the sample point times the volume of the little box, and then you add those up as you move, as you, for all the little boxes in the region. And because the region curves, some of your little boxes would hang over the, the boundary and some wouldn't. Uh, you add up all the ones that don't hang over, all the contributions from boxes that don't hang over the boundary, and then you can either count the ones on the boundary or not, and you get <coughs> a Riemann sum for the region. And you take the limit of that process as the size of the little subdivided boxes get smaller and smaller, and if that limit exists and is independent of how you chopped it up, how you picked the sample points, we say that the function, so the density function in this case, is Riemann integrable over, over this region, and we define the value of the, the triple integral to be that limit. So what we're looking at is we write three integral signs. <clears throat> we write the name of the region. You write the function that you're integrating. Here it would have been density, but in general it could be anything. And then we usually write a dv for to represent an infinitesimal piece of volume, but in the, in the Riemann sum, it's you evaluate the function at sample points, you multiply times the actual volumes of little boxes, you add them all up, and you take a limit as the size of the little boxes approaches zero, but you should think of that as a continuous sum, as x, y, and z vary over the points in S, of whatever the function is times an infinitesimal volume, dv. So when you have density, what you would write is something like, and mass is an application that we'll do in later sections, but it's a good example for right now. You'd write a little blob of mass, so think an infinitesimal little chunk of mass like we did in two dimensions, would be this density function. Now it's an honest to God density, mass per volume, not as we looked at in the last section. We, in the last section we did um, an area density. Uh, mass per unit area, but this is what most people refer to as density, the mass per volume. You take that mass per volume, multiply by a little bit an infinitesimal blob of volume, and you get an infinitesimal blob of mass. 
and you should think of, you should think of, oh, the total mass. It's the continuous sum of all the little blobs of mass as my points vary over the region S. Well, that's the triple, what we'll call the triple integral. In the more depth part of this section, we go into this in depth um, and talk about the limits of Riemann sums. But this is the idea. And of course, the question is, all right, great. So it's a limit of Riemann sums. But the question now is, all right, how do I calculate it? And you should, you should have an idea of how you do that, too, if you looked at the last section and the section before it. We'll use iterated integrals. Right? We actually want to describe this triple integral in terms of three one-variable integrals that are iterated, one followed by another. So the easiest way to, to uh, explain that is to give an example. Magically, there's an example here on the board. Suppose our solid region S, our solid region S is the region under the graph of the paraboloid, the circular paraboloid, z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared, and above the xy plane, above the xy plane under this graph, but above this region in the first quadrant. So I'm only looking at stuff where I'm taking x is greater than or equal to 0, y is greater than or equal to 0, and we want z is greater than or equal to 0, but we also want our z coordinates to be less than or equal to 4 minus x squared minus y squared. So we're looking at the region under this paraboloid, but above this quarter of a circle, a quarter of a disk in the, in the first quadrant of the xy plane. And what, it, what function am I going to integrate? I want to discuss integrating y. Why did I pick Y? Just because it makes the, the triple integral work out nicely, but the same discussion applies to integrating any function. We want to write this as an iterated integral. And so you have a choice of which order to integrate in. Do you want, you know, in the last section we could either do dx dy or dy dx. Well, now there are more choices like dz dy dx dz, dx, dy, dy, dz, dx. You, could, you can integrate in lots of different orders, but the problem can look very different in different orders, and it's, um, it's more difficult to see what the limits of integration should be here. I am going to put dz on the inside, dy in the middle, and dx on the outside, and we'll discuss why, you know, why I made those choices, and we'll make another choice in a minute and see what, how it changes what we do. Um, all right. If we have dz on the inside, then the limits of integration on z are allowed to be functions of x and y. And then you'll do that, and you'll get a function of x and y. And then the limits of integration on y are allowed to depend are allowed to be functions of x. And then to have any hope of getting a number, the limits of integration on x better just be numbers. And so one of the requirements for us to be able to calculate a triple integral well is for us to be able to at least split the integral up into pieces. And, and, maybe, and here we'll just have one piece, but at least be able to split it up into pieces where each region is described in some way like this. So this would mean that the region S needs to be of the form for us to, to evaluate this triple integral with this iterated integral. The region S has to be of the form, well, the x coordinates are between two numbers. The y coordinates are between these two functions of x. And these functions need to be continuous for us to calculate the Riemann integrals. And the z-coordinates need to be between two functions of continuous functions of x and y. Or if we picked some other order for the, the iterated integral, maybe we would permute the 
x, y's, and z's and have, oh, y is between a and b and um, x is between two functions of y. You know, so, yeah, it's, we need it to look like this to do the integral in this order, but if we did it in another order, you'd permute where you have the x, y's, and z's. But this is, means the regions have to be fairly simple. You know, I drew something weird on the other board when I was talking about a shape in general. But I, we give a name to this kind of region. I just call it an iterated region. It just means a region that's, well, basically set up nicely for doing iterated integrals. So uh, there's a more general definition of iterated region in more dimensions. But in three dimensions, it just means this kind of, in all dimensions, actually, it means this kind of iterated thing. One of, one of the variables is between two numbers. The, the next variable, whatever order you picked, is between two continuous functions of that variable. The next variable is between two continuous functions of the variables, variables before it, and so on. All right. Okay, fine. So we're going to write this triple integral in these terms, but the question is how do you figure out what these functions are that, and these numbers that form the limits of integration? And it's harder in three dimensions when you're working inside three dimensions than it was in two dimensions. Um, and so we talk about it slightly differently. You could have talked about it this way in two dimensions. It's just a little unnecessary. But you look at this region, this solid region, and what you want to do is to break the problem up into to this inside integral and then over, this is a little chunk of area, Right, this is dA, and you actually break this triple integral up into this inside one variable integral and an outside double integral, not, not initially iterated integral, but a double integral where you just say, ah, here's the region in the xy plane that I want to integrate over. Why do you do that? Because you look at this, how do you write this region as an iterated as an iterated region. So how do you figure out what these limits of integration should be? The nice thing that we say is you project, project into the xy plane. You can project into other planes. This actually means that we're choosing the z coordinate to be on the inside of our triple integral, of our iterated integral. What does projecting into the xy plane mean? It means well, kind of physically, and the reason we use project is if there were light, you know, if there were a light source, a wide light source, pointing straight down from above, so not just along the z-axis, but everywhere, this light source that's you know, up, at the, up at the top of the board, um, if you took that light source and then you looked at the shadow of this solid region in the xy plane, what you would get is this base this region in the xy plane, which I'm going to call r, and turning it how we normally draw the xy plane, our region r oops, would look like this quarter of a disk. And what r is, it, what's, it is not important that the solid region is up against the xy plane. It just depends on where the solid region bulges out, how far it sticks out. We're just trying to get every x and y coordinate that appears as the x and y coordinates of any triple that's in this solid region. So th this is supposed to be all those x and y coordinates such that there's a point in the solid region of the form one of these x coordinates, one of these x y pairs, comma, some z coordinate. But that's physically, you picture that as the projection. It's all the possible x y pairs for points in this solid region. All right, what do you do with that? Well, you break up this iterated evaluating or finding the correct iterated integral in, into the following steps, you decide that you're going to project into the xy plane and then for each point in that region you look at the corresponding points in your solid region. So for instance when I'm at a point in this region, all the points in this solid region that whose x and y coordinates are the same as the x and y coordinates of this yellow point in the region R, are these. 
the, the z coordinates of those, you get every z coordinate between zero and the z coordinate on the paraboloid. Same thing over here. At, you take an xy pair that's in the region R and all the corresponding points in the region S, the, one, the points that lie above that point in R, go from zero, go from z equals zero up to z equals up to the z coordinate on the paraboloid. What does that mean? It means that when we're trying to evaluate this triple integral, we break it up into a double integral and then a single integral inside. So what we do is we write this as, okay, it's the double integral over a region R times some little infinitesimal area. And I'll say again, we're going to write, this will become dy dx for us in a minute when we change that part into an iterated integral. But first you just go ahead and put the double integral over region R. Here's dA, a little chunk of area in the xy plane. And then what goes inside here? Well, your integrand, dz. So why is z on the inside? Because we projected into the xy plane and the, the coordinate you're missing, the z coordinate is the one that goes on the inside. And then you just describe what your z coordinates do as functions of the points in R. But we know what the z coordinates do. They start for every point in R, the z coordinates in our solid region go from z equals zero, so xy plane, up to whatever the z coordinate is on the paraboloid, but that's four minus x squared minus y squared. So those are your limits of integration on the inside variable, on the z coordinate. And now it's just, now you can just think of this. This is some function of x and y, and we need to calculate this double integral over R of dA. But R is this region. And double integrals are something we learned how to do in the last section. So now we've reduced this to something we learned how to do before. And we write the appropriate iterated integral for that. And I'll drop the square brackets. But, and I'm just going to pick that we'll put do dy dx. But we need to write the correct limits of integration to integrate over this region in the xy plane. What is that region? Well, you have to think about it. Um, this bounding quarter of a circle comes from where the paraboloid hits the xy plane. Well, that's where z equals zero. So that, <clears throat> that arc is part of zero equals four minus x squared minus y squared. Since we're in the first quadrant where y is positive, you can just solve for y and get y has to be the square root of 4 minus x squared. So that's an equation for that. We go out to 2 and 2. We don't care about this 2, really. So your x-coordinates go from 0 to 2. And for every x-coordinate between 0 and 2, your y-coordinates are going from 0 up to the y-coordinate on the circle. So for every, your x-coordinates go from 0 to 2, and for every x-coordinate between 0 and 2, your y-coordinates start down at 0 and go up to the y-coordinate on the quarter circle. But that's y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared. So this is the iterated integral that we get. I should say, you can think of this in terms of projection too. We didn't do this in two dimensions because you don't really need to think about it this way. But yes, you could think of this as, oh, and now I project this region into the x-axis. And then I do a similar thing to what we're doing with the triple integral. It's, oh, and then for every point in that projected region, you look at what the variable you project it away from does. Um, all right, one way or the other, you end up with this triple integral, uh, I'm sorry, this iterated integral, and then I'll, we'll evaluate it. The main reason I want to evaluate it right now is because I'm going to do the same triple integral, but 
with a different order on my iterated integrals, and we'd like to see that we get the same thing. If not, well, I've made a mistake. So let's see. So what we're getting is that the triple integral over our solid region S of y dv is the iterated integral from 0 to 2, from 0 to the square root of 4 minus x squared, from 0 to 4 minus x squared minus y squared, y dz dy dx. <laughs> I don't know if this looks overwhelmingly awful or not. It's, it's not that much worse than doing two iterated integrals. You just have another one first. And you, know, you just need to not be overwhelmed when you look at it. You just take it in steps. You do the inside integral first and then work your way out. So you, you, get, you just rewrite the first two integrals. And then the integral of y with respect to z. You just get y times z, but you have to evaluate as z goes from 0 to z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And then you still have the dy and the dx. I want to emphasize, again, why I write z equals and not both places instead of just 0 and that. I'm trying to be very explicit. You've got a bunch of variables floating around. And you need to know which things you're plugging in for which things. You know, you can you cannot write them. A lot of students don't write them. A lot of faculty members don't write them. But you run the risk at some point, a bigger risk of plugging in the wrong thing for the wrong thing sometimes. But hey, whatever you want to do. So <laughs> live on the edge. <laughs> don't write the z equals. Um, all right. If you plug in z equals that, you get y times that. Minus z equals 0, you just get 0. So we're getting 4y minus x squared y minus y cubed when you multiply that by y. 4y minus, yes. And we still have to integrate with respect to y and integrate with respect to x. But you do this. Now, it's, uh, now we're in a double integral, something we learned how to do, or to two-fold iterated integral. This is something we learned how to do in the last section. But let's go ahead and do it. You get the integral from 0 to 2. We're integrating with respect to y this time. So you get 4 times y squared over 2. So 2y squared. Then a minus x squared y squared over 2. And a minus y to the fourth over 4. And you evaluate as x goes from 0 to the square root of 4 minus x squared. And after we do that, we still have to integrate with respect to x. <laughs> it may look bad. It's, uh, it's not so bad. It's just polynomials. It's a little, a little ugly, but not. So terrible. So we get the integral from 0 to 2. You plug in the square root of 4 minus x squared. And the nice thing is that when you square that, you just get 4 minus x squared. So we get 2 times 4 minus x squared minus x squared times 4 minus x squared over 2 minus 4 minus x squared. All right, we have the square root of 4 minus x squared to the fourth. That's 4 minus x squared squared over 4. Then you integrate with respect to x. All right, what do you get? Well, I mean, we could inter integrate each part of that separately, but just things will simplify a little bit if you factor out a 4 minus x squared. Um, if you factor out a, the, actually, let's factor out a 1 fourth times 4 minus x squared. All right, what, do I, what am I left with after I do that? 
All right, here I'll get a 2. Here I'll get a, all right, I factored out a fourth. So, um, uh, what am I writing? Uh, what am I writing? Here I'll get an 8. <laughs> factor out a 4 minus x squared. Factor out a fourth. In other words, after I multiply by a fourth, I should get 2. So let's try. 8. Um, here you get a 2 times x squared. Uh, yeah, 2 times x squared. And here you get a minus 4 minus x squared dx. But what is this? This is 2 times. This is 2 times 4 minus x squared. So we can pull. So you get the integral from 0 to 2 of 1 fourth times 4 minus x squared times, now I can factor out another 4 minus x squared. So it's 4 minus x squared squared. And then I'm left with a, uh, I factored out another 4 minus x squared. I'm left with a 2 minus 1. Oh, oh yeah, this was 2 times 4 minus x squared minus 4 minus x squared. Oh, you just get another 4 minus x squared. So we're left with this, which looks a little better. <laughs> now you can calculate this is the integral from 0 to 2 of 1 fourth, you get 16 minus 8x squared minus or uh, plus x to the fourth. You integrate with respect to x any minute now, we're going to get the final answer. You get 1 fourth, and then it's 16x minus 8x cubed over x plus x to the fifth over 5. You evaluate from 0 to 2. When at 0, you get 0, so we just get what you get at 2. We get 1 fourth times 32 minus, all right, 2 cubed 8, 64 thirds. That's 64 thirds. Plus 2 to the fifth, that's 32, plus 32 fifths. So that's what we get. Um, we can, I'm going to go ahead and multiply by the fourth. I think I'll try to cram the answer in right here. We actually want to simplify this a little bit so that we can compare it with what we're going to get in a minute. If I multiply through by the fourth, what we're getting is 8 minus 16 thirds plus 8 fifths. If you write everything in terms of fifteenths, we get 8 times 15, which is 120, 120 fifteenths, minus 5 times that, so minus 80 fifteenths, plus 24 fifteenths, what is this, 64 fifteenths, all right, so <laughs> that's what you get. The actual calculation is, you know, a little tedious. But it's not difficult. Setting up, taking the triple integral and setting up the right limits of integration is pretty much the big problem. Um, now what I'd like to do, and the reason I was adamant that we wanted to get an answer there, is that I want to set up a different iterated integral that calculates the same triple integral. It'll look different along the way, and yet we better get 64 fifteenths for the answer, otherwise something's not working right. All right, so I want to calculate the same triple integral. So that means we're integrating over the same region, we have the same integrand, but we're going to set up the triple integral differently. And that means intuitively, so, or geometrically, that you're projecting onto a different coordinate plane at the very beginning. We projected into the xy plane I now would like to project into the yz plane. I think that's the one that I used in the book. Uh, uh, yes, into the, into the, no, I projected into the xz plane. So, all right, so 
we had this solid region. So above here, so it's not, it doesn't curl around the back, it's just above the first quadrant in the xy plane. That solid region, we projected down into the xy plane, but what if we had chosen a different projection? Like, it may be a little harder to see, and kind of projection in the xy plane is kind of one of our favorites because we set things up to be able to see that one fairly easily. But what if we projected into the XZ plane? So if you had a flashlight and you shine it, or a big flashlight so it doesn't spread out, so, or, big, or it's, there's just all light, there's a bunch of light over here, and you look at the shadow in the XZ plane, what you're going to see is this region over here, or the projection in the XZ plane, is going to be that that part of a parabola and of course we've turned things to picture things how we know in the picture here's the positive x positive z but I've turned it what is this edge that we're seeing I remind you that this was z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared so that edge that you're seeing is where the y-coordinate is 0, it's z equals 4 minus x squared. So that's part of the parabola, z equals 4 minus x squared. And now we're going to use this as our projected region, r. And the, the iterated integral that that will give us will be very different. We will, you still have the same integrand, y. But because we project it into the xz plane, that means the y-coordinate is your inside variable of integration. So we're going to have this. And now we take the double integral over this region r times dA. But our problem now is to write the correct limits of integration for what y does, not because it's the integrand, but because it's the inside variable. We want to know, in their projected region, the y-coordinate goes from where to where. Well, here's your projected region. For each point in the projected region, your y-coordinate goes, it's a little hard to picture, and that's one of the reasons we like projecting into the xy-plane. But for every point in that region, in the xz-plane, your y-coordinates start at y equals 0, the xz-plane, and go out to the y-coordinate, go out to the y-coordinate, on, on the paraboloid. If you're at this point, the perspective is a little difficult. But if you're at this point in the xz plane, your y coordinates start at y equals 0 and go out to the y coordinate on the paraboloid. What is that y coordinate? You have to solve this for y. So put the y squared over there, the z over there. You get y squared equals 4 minus x squared minus z, no squared there. And then we're where y is positive, so y is just the square root of 4 minus x squared minus z. So that's what your y-coordinate does. It goes from 0 for each point in your projected region. Your y-coordinates start at y equals 0 and go out to y equals the square root of, let me write this smaller or lower or something, of 4 minus x squared minus z. And now you're reduced to a double integral. Now your limits of integration for the other variables, which the remaining variables are x and z, I guess I'll put z on the inside and um, x on the outside as before. Um, to integrate over this region r, so first of all where, where z is 0, again it's, this will be x is 2. So your x-coordinate is once again going from 0 to 2, but your y-coordinate, I'm sorry, your z-coordinate starts down here at, for any x-coordinate between 0 and 2, your z-coordinate starts at 0 and goes up to the z-coordinate on this parabola. So that means your z-coordinates are starting at 0 and going up to z equals 4 minus x squared. 
should write this somewhere else. Right, you're starting at z equals 0 and going up to z equals 4 minus x squared. So that's this upper limit of integration. The square root, uh, no square root, z equals 4 minus x squared. That. And now this is the iterated integral that you need to do. You don't, I wouldn't normally write the square brackets at this point. But you calculate this, and I am going to calculate it to verify, well, two things that the steps along the way don't look like the steps we had before. I mean, of course, you're integrating kind of polynomial things, but the intermediate steps look very different than what we got before, and yet we better get the same final answer, 64 fifteenths, but we'll see. I'll leave 64 fifteenths trapped over here. All right, so we get the integral from 0 to 2, the integral from 0 to 4 minus x squared, and then you integrate y dy, and you get y squared over 2. And it's evaluated as y goes from 0 to y equals the square root of 4 minus x squared minus z. Don't get carried away. There's no square on the z. It's tempting because so many things are squared in the problem, but not that one. And then times dz times dx. And we get the integral from 0 to 2. The integral from 0 to 4 minus x squared. Um, you put in this, it's squared immediately, so that gets rid of the square root. So we get 4 minus, well, we get 1 half times 4 minus x squared minus z minus what you get at 0, which is 0. So we just get this, about, and then we have to integrate with respect to z and then with respect to x. All right, so you do this inside integral with respect to z. You get, maybe I'll try to fit it right there dz dx, we get the integral from 0 to 2, uh, we get the half, you integrate with respect to z, so we get 4z minus x squared z minus z squared over 2. This is evaluated as z goes from 0 to 4 minus x squared, and then when we finish doing that, we still have to integrate with respect to x. All right. So what do we get? I guess I'll pull this half all the way out. Integral from 0 to 2. All right. You plug in z is 4 minus x squared. We get 4 times 4 minus x squared minus x squared times 4 minus x squared minus x, 4 minus x squared squared over 2, subtracting what you get when z is 0, but that's 0, so it doesn't show up. And we have to do this integral with respect to x. You know, it looks a little messy, but it's not difficult. What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to do essentially something that looks like what I did when we were doing this problem the other way. I'm going to pull out another half. So I'll put an extra half out here, but that means I have to multiply by 2 over here. That gives us an 8 here, a minus 2x squared here. I'm just trying to get rid of this denominator. And then a, that. Again, you see a factor of 4 minus x squared everywhere. So this is 1 quarter, the integral from 0 to 2, of 4 minus x squared times whatever we're left with, which is an 8 a minus 2x squared, uh, an 8, a minus 2x squared, 8, a minus 2x squared, and a minus, and a minus 4 minus x squared dx. But just as we got before, this is 2 times 
4 minus x squared, this part. It's 2 times 4 minus x squared minus another 4 minus x squared. That's 4 minus x squared. Right? All of this is just 4 minus x squared because this is 2 times 4 minus x squared minus another 4 minus x squared. That's 4 minus x squared times 4 minus x squared. We get 4 minus x squared squared. So, yeah, the intermediate steps, like the integral we did first and um, this, didn't look like what we got before, but now, even before we evaluate this one, we're getting exactly the integrand we had before with the fourth out front, 4 minus x squared squared, integrate from 0 to 2. Yes, you get 64 fifteenths. You might think, oh, so it always looks the same near the end. Like, oh, that is what we had before. Well, that's because we had dz, uh, dx on the outside like we did before, but if we had messed up the order of all the integrals, there's no reason for you to see a familiar integral at all. You know, one, you know, the, an integral that comes up doing one order doesn't have to come up in the other order. You just need to get the same final answer. All right. That's, those are two examples, or I don't know, or one example done two different ways of triple integrals. I just want to do one more, and it, it, this one will be quick. As I said, um, we're actually going to do a lot of applications of triple integrals in later sections, so this section isn't on applications, but I just want to set up one more triple integral. Triple integral. We won't evaluate the iterated integral. Um, we won't even pick a specific integrand function for the integrand. The problem, typically, with triple integrals is setting up the right limits of integration. Actually doing the iterated integrals, it can be a mess, but that's not usually the hard part. So, um, I want to look at <coughs> another example. Uh, we'll see how well I can draw this. So, and the reason I want to at least do one more is I want to make certain that you understand that the projected region doesn't have to be where the solid region hits one of the coordinate planes like it was in those two examples. It's kind of the part that bulges out the most. It doesn't have to actually touch the xy plane or the, the xz plane. So the example that I want to look at is this one. So I want to take I want to take an example where you've got a parabola, and it's really a parabolic, a slanted parabolic cylinder. So I'm just going to take this same parabola and move, and you know, you'd think cylinder, well first you'd think of right circular cylinder, but the more general notion, oh, what if I just had this same parabola everywhere for every z coordinate? Yeah, well I'm not just doing that. I'm taking the same parabola, but as I move down I'm sliding it over, so this slanted parabolic cylinder that, so you just imagine moving that parabola over as your z coordinate drops, so it would look like that, but I'm only going to take the portion that's, that has the y coordinate greater than zero. Um, and we're going to look at the resulting, the resulting solid region. The solid region, what solid region? The solid region that is trapped below, I cut this off at z equals 2. I'm going to say that I chop this off at z equals 2. We want z greater than or equal to 0. And then I'm looking at the solid region bounded by those three surfaces. The plane z equals 2, the plane, I guess I'll say the plane, z equals 0, and this slanted parabola, uh, this slanted parabolic cylinder, which is y equals 2z minus x squared. So I'm, what I'm describing is the solid region S. Um, 
the solid region S and it's uh, a little annoying to try to draw in perspective but it's behind this slanted parabolic cylinder why is this why does this give you this if you think about it for each z coordinate you're just getting different parabolas that all curve in the negative x direction but all you've done is change where their vertex is well that's what we were doing we we're sliding the vertex along so the solid region s that i'm having trouble shading is is this one that's kind of to the in my picture to the left of that parabolic cylinder and under this curve and to the right more or less of the of where y is zero so to the right of the xz plane and what I want to the solid picture looks a lot better in the book where I can have computer software draw it but that's the solid region s and the whole question is if I want to integrate any continuous function if I want to integrate any continuous function I don't care what it is over the solid region s what are some limits of integration that I can use well there are at least two good regions actually you could project in any direction you wanted you can project into the xy plane you can project into the xz plane where you get this kind of filled in parabola you could project into the yz plane where it looks like you'd get a triangle or the inside of a triangle but what i want to give an example what i'm trying to give an example of here is how you project and get how you project into something that it's a region that's not touching or the, the projected region isn't exactly where that plane <laughs> hits the solid region so I do want to project into the YZ uh, in the XY plane and my whole point with this example is that when you project this into the XY plane you get it's like it's where the shadow of this shines down what you'll get <laughs> let's try that again what you'll get is is this part where the solid region bulges out the most it's not the part that's up against the xy plane it's this copy it's this it's a copy of this filled in piece of a parabola but projected into the xy plane because that's the part that sticks out the most and if you really do hold a, a flashlight or a wide flashlight so have a light source everywhere up here the shadow is going to be this part that bulges out the most and what is that well it's what's trapped inside the parabola where where z is 2 and you hit this slanted parabolic cylinder so this thing in terms of x and y is well it's where you hit z equals 2 you're seeing what you're seeing up there I'm going to draw the xy plane but you should keep in mind it's really a copy of the a copy of the xy plane that's at z equals 2 not at z equals 0 but we talk about it projected down into the xy plane um, but if you're happier thinking of it as the copy of the xy plane at z equals 2, that's fine. But which one is it? Well, it's where z equals 2. So you get y equals 4 minus x squared. So when z equals 2, you get y equals 4 minus x squared. And so that's the, that's the parabola that you're seeing as this edge in perspective. And as before, this, or, well, I guess not as before. The x coordinate, I was going to say as before, x coordinate goes from negative 2 to 2, but in our last example, it went from 0 to 2 because we didn't allow negative x's, but here we are. So our x coordinate is going from minus 2 to 2, and we're looking at this. So this is our projected region R. So 
What does this mean you do? It means that this triple integral becomes the double integral over r. We're, if we're projecting into the xy plane, your z coordinate is on the inside. We're integrating whatever our function is. I'm going to stop writing the of xyz. It's taking up too much space. But you integrate whatever our function is with respect to z on the inside. You'll have a dA here. And then for each point in our projected region, so think of it down here in the xy plane, the corresponding z coordinates, so when I'm at this point in the xy plane, in our projected region r, so it's here, in our projected region r, the z coordinates don't start at zero. It's the corresponding z coordinates in your solid region. Well, they start up here. They start up here above that point. And then they go up to z equals 2. If you're at this point, they start your in the projected region, they start here, and then they go up to z equals 2. So your z coordinates in your solid region, if you, someone specifies an x and a y in r, starts at the z coordinate on this parabolic cylinder, and then goes up to z equals 2. So the inside limits of integration here, you go up to z equals 2, and, but you start at, you need to solve this for z in terms of x and y. This is 2z. 2z equals y plus x squared. Or what's the same thing? z equals 1 half y plus x squared. And those are your inside limits of integration. Your z coordinate starts at 1 half for any xy pair in the region r. Your z coordinates in the solid region in the solid region S start at 1 half y plus x squared. So they start on your, at the z coordinate on your parabolic cylinder and they go up to z equals 2. All right. Well then, what are the limits of integration? What, what's the iterated integral for A? Well now you could do dx on the inside or dy on the inside. I always, you know, if it doesn't matter, I tend to like dx on the outside, dy on the inside. Once again, I'll say that that trapped, that parabola that you're seeing right there is where the slanted paraboloid hit z equals 2, so it's y equals 4 minus x squared. So your x-coordinates, if you set this up, if you replace this with an iterated integral with x on the outside, your x-coordinates go from minus 2 to 2. And your y-coordinates. For any x-coordinate between minus 2 and 2, to integrate over r, your y-coordinates start at 0 and go up to the y-coordinate on the parabola. Y-coordinates start at 0 and go up to the y-coordinate on the parabola. So your y-coordinates are starting at 0. And the y-coordinate on the parabola, 4 minus x squared. And this is the threefold, the iterated integral, or an iterated integral, that you could use to evaluate the triple integral of any function f over that solid region. Um, yeah, you would get different limits of integration if you project into the um, xz plane or into the yz plane. It, it would look very different. But my real point, I'll say it one more time, of doing this example is just to get across to you that your projected region is not, in one of the coordinate planes, is not necessarily where your solid region intersects the coordinate plane. It's all a matter of where your solid region sticks out the most. And really think about the shadow and pr really projecting it every place that you've got those xy pairs in your solid region, not just pairs that occur where, you're that, where the xy plane hits your solid region. All right. That's all the examples I want to do right now. Uh, in the next few sections, we're going to look at applications of double and triple integrals, and we'll see a lot more of them there.